You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Voyager episode, Revulsion. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, and for English speakers, the title of today's episode is Revulsion. I wanted to say it like that the uh, actor in it says, says it to the <laughs> revulsion yeah. uh, and Father Corey Sticker. Hey, Father Corey. How's it going? Good, good. And so folks, uh, be sure to stick around to the end of the show. We have more of your great listener feedback. Uh, be sure to share the podcast with your friends, help uh, us grow this community of Star Trek fans and to reach even more listeners. And uh, I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Star Wars, which you can find wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Star Wars. So we are discussing this fourth season Voyager episode, the fifth fifth episode of the fourth season. And Jimmy, can you give us a recap of what happens? This week, Voyager gets a distress call from an alien hologram. The hologram says there's been an accident on its ship, the whole crew is dead, and it's alone. Janeway sends the Doctor and B'Elanna in a shuttle to help the hologram while they do other stuff. This leads to our time-filling B-plot, in which Harry Kim is assigned to help Seven of Nine do some science-y stuff, and he becomes infatuated with her, which leads to a lot of awkwardness played for laughs that goes nowhere. Meanwhile, Balana and the Doctor discover that the alien hologram is childlike, emotionally fragile, psychotic, and homicidal. The accident that happened on its ship actually involved it killing all six of the organic members of its crew. It invites the Doctor to steal the ship it's on and come with it to explore the galaxy, and it becomes hysterical when he wants to go back to Voyager. Eventually, it attacks Balana and the Doctor, it takes the Doctor offline by striking his mobile emitter, which it steals, and it severely wounds Balana. but she finally shorts it out with an electrical cable, so all is well with the world again. The end. Father Curry, your impression of this one? This is one of these episodes where it's got one decent plot and one very cringy plot. Um, <laughs> I, you know, the, the, the plot with the with the uh, the hologram, the isomorphic projection. I mean, this this was very much a development episode for the Doctor. At least that that plot was very much to develop the Doctor's character to do it, you know to show what could happen, the risk for the Doctor that if, if his program goes awry and so on. So I mean, it, it was that part was decent. That was a decent plot. The Harry Kim and Seven of Nine was cringy. It was eye candy for for men. I mean it. It would have been so much better episode if that was just not the B plot. Mm. How about you, Jimmy? I thought overall the episode was okay. Um, I focused on the hologram plot and it was okay. The actor, a guy, it was, uh, he's a guy named Leland Orser who was mm-hmm. playing the, the, the alien hologram. He was good. He did a good job of being childlike, fragile, and psychotic mm-hmm. um and he's a genuinely scary guy i could you know find fault with his performance on a few things but but overall um i thought it was i thought that plot was good i thought the harry kim thing was totally superfluous yeah um it's also meant it's also meant to develop seven because mm-hmm. seven this is like only her third episode as a member of the crew yeah. You know, she was kind of introduced, but wasn't really a crew member in the season opener two-parter. But this is like the fifth episode of the season, so she's been a crew member now for three episodes. This is early days for her, and so this is meant to develop her character as well. Yeah. Um, apparently, Leland Orser, the the guest actor, was um, heading out to, to film Saving Private Ryan. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. So they only had four days to film all of his scenes uh, before he had to go. Uh, so, um, I, I liked the main plot as well. I, I guess I'm in agreement with both of you that it was uh, pretty good. Uh, the director was Kevin, uh, Ken Biller, who is normally a writer. Uh, this was his first directing credit on Voyager. And I think he did a pretty creditable job. He's, uh, he apparently was inspired a lot by the movie Psycho, especially like he almost mm-hmm. like exact yeah. framing of the shot for some of them from right out of the movie Psycho. Yeah, like there's a scene where he, where the hologram is bringing a, a plate of food to Balana that is 
reminiscent of the scene in Psycho where Norman Bates brings sandwiches to Marion. Mm-hmm, um, right. And they have a kind of a little bit of an uncomfortable exchange. But Psycho isn't Psycho without the shower scene. Nope. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Or the twist at the end. Yes. And this doesn't have either one of those. That's yep. true. That's true. Uh, it was a surprisingly gruesome first shot where um, we see Leland sort of cleaning up after the crime and we see him pull one of the cr- dead crew members off of a bench and it leaves a smear of bright red blood uh, yep. down the wall and across the floor. And that was that was fairly dra- graphic for, you know, Voyager at the time, you know, for TV. It wasn't network TV, it was, but it was uh, cable syndication. That's another thing that, where this differs from Psycho because in Psycho, you don't know what Norman Bates is in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, the movie is set up to make you think that Marion is the psycho because she. we start focusing on this character, Marion. She's like the first act of the film is all about her. She's, she's, having an, she's, she's working in an office job. She's having an affair with the guy on the side. A bunch of money comes into her office, and she steals the money and goes on the lam. And, you know, the whole first act of Psycho is about her. Norman is not even in it. And, mm-hmm. and we're pain- Hitchcock is painting this portrait of Marion as a psycho because of what she's doing in her life. And eventually, she stops at the Bates Motel, and she starts talking to Norman, and she starts realizing she's made a mistake. And she knows something creepy is going on with Norman's mother. And then apparently out of the blue, Norman's mother kills her in the shower. And so there's multiple layers before we Mm -hmm. find out what's really going on at the Bates Motel, which I'm deliberately Mm -hmm. not alluding to directly. (laughs) And there's nothing like that here. With the opening, with seeing, seeing the hologram cleaning up, or isomorph as they call it, which actually mm-hmm. is a better name than hologram. Right. Iso, isos in Greek means equal and morphe means form. So yeah, he's got an equal form to mm-hmm. a human or whatever his species is. Um, hologram means whole writing. <laughs> and isomorph actually makes better sense. But yeah. um, we see him cleaning up from a murder. And it's like, we know what this this thing is is messed up from the beginning it would it would there would be more tension in this it would be more like psycho if 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 we if they didn't have that opening and the first thing we learn about this is help i'm desperate there's been an accident my crew is dead and not even necessarily know that it's a uh, that it's a hologram and they could still send the doctor not because it's mm-hmm. a hologram but because they may need medical attention mm-hmm. And then you, know, you can find out it's a hologram. I mean, it's, I could see going either way. I, I, you, you know, you've often seen them do that in various other stories, uh, but in this one, where you, you, the audience knows information that the that the the, mm-hmm. the cast does, the crew doesn't, the characters don't from the beginning, and you know, it, it creates a different kind of tension. Like, when are they going to figure yeah. it out? When are they going to figure it out? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, I think it, I, I could go either way with that uh, on on that story. Yeah, it's it's just a different way of telling the same story, but I it, I think it worked fine for tension as well because you know there, the scenes where we know that this guy is going completely off the rails, mm-hmm. and Bellana's like, well, he just kind of ranted at me for a while. It's like, <laughs> no, he did more than rant at you; he was ready to kill yeah. you right there. Yeah. Also, if you're trying to do Psycho, don't pair it with a comedy. No, <laughs> don't because <laughs> no. you undermine the tension. Uh, he apparently went crazy partially. Uh, the 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 isomorph did because it had been confined to the antimatter storage room his whole existence like that's mm-hmm. his, his job was to clean the antimatter storage room and to, to get rid of the waste and I think like just I was trying to you know kind of go beyond the story itself and think why would you need a holographic humanoid to do that job why not a robot or an amorphous set of force fields and tractor beams why do you need a, a uh, a, a, something that has the form of an intelligent person with a whole personality as well. It just seemed kind of an odd thing. You know, it, it, it's it's not that it's implausible that a culture would do this. Maybe there's some sort of cultural norm that would require that any any creature you make a golem of some sort has to have 
uh, to to be human as much as possible or something. I don't know. What would you think of that? Well, it's it's. I mean, it, it's plausible depending on what the development of these isomorphs really were in the past. You know, we could think of mm-hmm. think of you know maybe there are certain regulations to for what they can be used for and can't. You know how how intelligent they can make them. You know, mm-hmm. with the discussion we have about, around AI, you know what what are the limits of those that development that we're going to have in our culture. Maybe that's something that, um, you know, they, I mean, they, they don't talk about any of this background. We just know that this guy was, was programmed right. for one purpose, you know, feed in fuel, get rid of waste basically. Mm. Yeah. But there is, and I assume this was some kind of off the shelf technology for them that they were applying in a bunch of circumstances because it could yeah. do the jobs. Um, even if it wasn't designed for them, the problem is that they, they, they gave it more capacity than it was required for the jobs and that created a conflict with the environments it was being put into to where mm-hmm. it started to resent being kept in a closet and and that's that's what you don't want to program your AIs to do mm-hmm. um, so uh, so it was it was a bad fit between the technology they were applying and the purpose to which they were applying it and it went crazy and killed everybody as you do and of course, you've got the parallel between the doctor being stuck in sick bay, which mm-hmm. is much bigger than obviously this space, but mm-hmm. still he was stuck in one room, one part of the ship that he couldn't get to uh, anywhere else. And, and this, this isomorph, but of course the doctor then gets the mobile emitter and has free reign of the mm-hmm. ship at that point. And he yeah. also, this is a kind of a path not taken story. It mm-hmm. shows what could have happened with the doctor in some dark scenario that the writers would never allow to actually play out but the doctor was had to be assertive and demand you know more respect from the crew which is true although actually in the list of of examples he gives he's his memory is flawed which is a sign of problems coming down the line because he's misremembering that Janeway volunteered some of the privileges he's name privileges mm-hmm. he's naming to him as things he had to ask for mm-hmm. yep yeah, because yeah, the doctor sort of you know sympathizes at first, and then encourages the Jaren to think about, um, you know, the it, the it, trust it, that the doctor had to had to gain yeah. to, to get it, his. It's even more than sympathy, and this is one of the flaws in the writing in Voyager that I really don't like. He's he's identif- in the beginning. He's identifying so much mm-hmm. with the hologram that it it's he's, he's blinded. He's blind. Mm-hmm. And to to what's going on with the hologram in ways he shouldn't be, um, and that helps set up the drama by making him reluctant. So you get a little bit of a clash between him and Balana about how much leeway should we show this guy? Is he really crazy? You got to understand his background and stuff like that. But the doctor's just blind to, and it's obvious to the viewer the doctor is blind to to what's really going on with this guy in ways that he shouldn't be. Right. And that I think is a writing flaw. Well, right from the, the start, where the you know on the bridge, as soon as they get this communication, the doctor's like, you know, send a message. I'm going to go over, and the, yeah. the captain's like, uh, as far as I remember, I'm still the captain of this ship. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he he really oversteps, which is interesting. Well, it's, you know, I, I guess I I don't see that as a writing flaw. I see that showing the enthusiasm. I mean, that the doctor, you know, this is a situation the doctor hasn't experienced yet. Mm-hmm. And he's so excited that this is another potentially sentient hologram that he can interact with. You know, it, it, it'd be another person of his species. So I, I don't, I don't see it as a writing flaw. Maybe it wasn't ri- written well, but I don't see it as a writing flaw in any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I, I, I just see it as, as um, again, you know, he just. He, I think it was intentional. The doctor is, is kind of like yeah. a child himself. I mean, he's only yeah. technically four years old at this point. Right. Yeah. I yeah. saw it as an intentional thing that they wanted him to be blinded yeah. by his bias mm-hmm. in favor of the hologram. And and that's I think actually a sign that Starfleet's programming of him is defective. Oh yeah. Because as as the medical as the emergency medical officer for this ship, taking care of this ship should be his dominant priority. Right. And it's like and so I, he shouldn't be so oversteppy well he should be more concerned about because what janeway points out to him is look i don't i don't want to risk losing you over there because you know my concern is the medical welfare of this ship and janeway is having to explain 
to the device whose function it is to care for the medical welfare of the ship, that that needs to be his priority. They kind of lean into this later on when they have him meet his creator on Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Jupiter Station uh, and see how flawed he was. And in fact, the fact that he was putting his own personality imprint into his holograms, I think you're right. It does show that the Starfleet's oversight of this program was indeed flawed. Uh, It shouldn't have been uh, you know the way it was and the doctor should maybe have been less independent ironically we would not have been the doctor we came to you know for some of us know and love because he would have been much more constrained into the role that he should have been the i think they could still rationalize it i mean all janeway has to do is give him an order go over there that guy may need medical help you know right. and they could still make it work maybe starfleet Although I, I think this may be giving the writers a little much credit, but maybe Starfleet, it, at least it's, it's plausible to me, you could say maybe Starfleet, Starfleet learned from this experience because the emergency command hologram program of Janeway acts mm. much more responsibly in Voyager, I'm mm. sorry, in Prodigy right. than the Doctor does here in Voyager. That's true, right? They probably learned a lot from the, from mm. the Doctor being online for seven years and, and, and going through this evolution. Uh, we alluded to the scene where Dejarin's first starts to unwind in front of Bolana, um, and I, I, I like this scene. It was pretty. It was pretty effective because you know he, he how why he finds and this is where we get the title revulsion. You know he finds organics disgusting. You know he the way he describes people. Uh, he says, uh, "I exist as pure energy, but you depend on food and water to survive. Frankly, I find it disgusting. Look at you." Grinding up bits of plants and animals with your teeth, secreting saliva to force it down your esophagus into a pit of digestive acids. You can't even stand to think of it yourself. What a repulsive creature you are, constantly shedding your skin and hair, leaving your oily sweat on everything you touch. I'm like, by this point, I'm like, yeah, we are pretty gross. Ew. <laughs> yeah. We're and gross, said, but you know what? That f- the food part is pretty pleasurable. So like, <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. He also says he's ashamed to be made in our image. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I have my in my notes good casting uh, because yeah. I think the I think Leland Orser was really good for this yeah. part. He he played he's played characters like this before in the yeah. past where yeah. very kind of psychotic or just off. You know, yeah. he's mm-hmm. really good at playing this kind of character. He's done other kind of characters, but this is one that he does really really well. They also made they changed his skin color, and it it's kind of like Data's mm-hmm. to indicate he's artificial. But it's he's not physically artificial, but he's artificial, and but he's he's more pallid than Data yep. is. You know, Data's more golden. This guy's a little more silver, and that pallid, not human skin tone also helps make him creepy. Yep. Yes, the and the the design, like the 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 uh, alien ship, is very much lots of shadows, n- very monocolor, black and white. Yep. Um, you know, in, in fact, maybe the, his pallid color and the monochrome set is meant to also invoke the idea of the old, old black and white thrillers, like psychological thrillers too. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I wonder, I didn't see anything about that, but that makes or me just everything on Voyager got dark. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it, it was clear from the start, like they do make it early on, even after the, um, scene where he's cleaning up the bodies when Bellana and, uh, the doctor first show up and they, like, they haven't met him yet. And he appears behind them silently mm-hmm. and he picks up a hammer and he starts approaching. And then the doctor, I forget what the, exactly the doctor says, uh, and he makes him immediately stop, you know, disappear. The hammer falls out of nowhere, which is <laughs> super creepy. And then he appears in front of them. Hey, I'm here. And, and that's yep. the, you know, the, it's, it's very effectively creepy that, that, you know, it, he's almost like a ghost. And maybe that's another aspect of his, uh, skin tone that they've, they've given him is mm-hmm. he's like a ghost as well, a malevolent ghost. It's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. By the way, we should mention um, there are a few extra little subplots in this episode that we mm-hmm. haven't even touched on. One of them is we open with, um, with Tuvok getting a promotion from lieutenant to lieutenant commander, mm-hmm. which I guess this is an interesting situation because in a real military People would move up over the course of seven years and move off to other assignments mm-hmm. in a way they don't here because they're stuck in the Delta Quadrant. And that would pose Janeway with interesting challenges regarding promotions because 
you can inflate people's ranks, but they're still going to be doing the same jobs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so Tuvok, yeah. Tuvok gets a promotion, um, even though he's still just the security chief. Yeah. And and Harry isn't. And Harry isn't. <laughs> and if 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 you're gonna if you're gonna have to, so Jane would be in this interesting position where she's got to figure out when to use promotions. Mm-hmm. Because she can't just promote everybody all at once and make them all, you know, commanders. So she needs to th- ration who she gives promotions to because it's one of the few rewards she's got to give people career-wise. And and of all people, Tuvok would understand why she doesn't he, why he doesn't need to get a promotion. You know, it's it, he he doesn't have that human ego to bruise or stroke. Uh, which is essentially all promotions are in this case. I would say that um, a couple of things on that. Yeah. One is the promotion may not be just for Tuvok, but for the rest of the crew sort of designate Tuvok is third in command of the ship. And so right. he ranks higher than the chief mm-hmm. engineer and, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. So I can see that one do that. And I'm not sure if it's in today's Navy, it's the same way, but even in the past, especially like in the age of sail, when the ships would go far out of range of the Admiralty, you know, the, the British mm-hmm. Admiralty, they, the, the captain generally had a lot of leeway over his crew's promotion um, to, to a degree. And each of the roles had a variety of, or a range of ranks that could be in it. So you could mm-hmm. be a midshipman in charge of a gun division, but you could also be a lieutenant. You know, and so there was that opportunity that they could move move up within that, and there'd be a range in there. And I could see her doing some of that, but it is it is glaring, and I think all Trek fans have noticed how glaring it is that Harry just gets stuck. Like, yeah. with it. and it's not like he's incompetent. She relies on him for every, you know, just as much as any of the other senior staff. So why is Harry stuck? I, I've never seen an adequate explanation of that. Part of it may be off screen um, because Garrett Wang, who plays Harry Kim, even though he's very personable in the role, mm-hmm. had a reputation on set for not being the most professional actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, he like wouldn't know his lines and stuff like that. And like one of the things that um, that they did on in the Star Trek production house to reward actors who were doing a good job is if the actor wanted to direct and could show they're being a professional actor, they show up on time, they know their lines and they do all the study needed to become a director, then they'll let him direct. Mm-hmm. Garrett Wong. No. Yeah. Um, because he, he apparently had a reputation. I don't know for missing his call times or for not knowing his lines, but he was regarded as not being professional enough. And consequently, he never got a chance to direct, although I believe, at least that's the vibe I get. Mm. Um, Another subplot that happens in this, since Cass is now gone, we need a new nurse in sickbay. And so the doctor recruits Tom Paris for that role. And Balana had apparently just shortly before this confessed her love for Tom in an emergency circumstance. Two episodes ago. Yeah. 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 And so now, so they're dealing with the, he and Balana are dealing briefly with that at the aftermath of that confession at the beginning. And Tom broaches the subject with her and she's like, oh yeah. Uh, he's like, I know you probably didn't mean it. And she's like, oh no, I meant it, but I don't <laughs> expect you to reciprocate. So let's just pretend I never said it. And he just kisses her. <laughs> Which is exactly the right thing he needed to do at that point. That was right. good writing. I like that. Yeah. Uh, the Tom Bolana relationship in the, in the back half of the series was, was pre- pretty good. I, I, I was pretty happy with, I mean, they had its ups and downs in the writing, but I'm yeah. glad they did it. Uh, that, that made sense. One, one, one thing I want to go, I want to go back because I didn't get a chance to address yeah. it um, uh-huh. was with the military ranks. Um, you know, Dom, you asked if, if like the Navy could, promote you know that the commander has lee in promoting and i can say for the air force that there is some i mean as you said a lot of positions have rank specific you know if you're going to be in this position you must be a one-star general if you're going to be in this position and there are, are also some like chaplain for example where you've got these ranges of uh you know like first lieutenant to major where you're mm-hmm. just you're a chaplain um 
But then there's some leeway in that as well. Like, like you said, where if someone is performing extremely well, the commander can absolutely put in for this person to get a promotion like that. Now, of course, today we're very rarely in the situation where any military is not in contact with their superiors at some point, you mm-hmm. know, with satellite communication, even, you know, even the, the carrier that's out in the deepest, darkest uh, Pacific Ocean can still get a hold of an admiral fairly right. easily. You know, so that's, that's a very rare circumstance, but you hear battlefield promotions, for example, that is still a thing. That's Mm -hmm. still very much a thing. We don't have a lot of that today, but that could very much happen, you know, in necessity. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it, it, for this to, to, I I do think it's likely, like you said, Dom, that she is saying he's our second, he's our, he's our number two. Chakotay is number one. Yeah. Yeah. He's number two. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, just like data was data was, you know, was the sec was the number, th- was the number two. He was the, the third, second third in command on the enterprise, yeah. you know, same yeah. kind of deal. So, yep. Um, well, another sort of plot hole thing. Why does Voyager continue to drop off crew members in shuttlecraft? <laughs> Cause every time they do it last episode, this episode, three episodes ago in day of honor, yeah. th- it goes wrong every single time. <laughs> well, this was this this was irritating because they had this. The whole idea was that Voyager was going to meet with this ambassador of an alien race, and so they just say, "Okay, Belana and Doctor, you guys just take off in the the shuttlecraft, and we're going to go this way instead." You yeah, know, and our, that that was only and that was only so Neelix could get his. You know, Ethan Phillips could get his. You know, five minutes on screen so he could get paid for this episode, basically. <laughs> right. But it was just, yeah. So instead of saying, hey, we'll, you know, we'll go meet with the ambassador, you know, after we take care of this issue, go find We're out. We're going to drop off our only doctor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. because of the, it's because of the constraint of episodic writing where mm-hmm. we just need to have things go wrong and we need to not be able to solve them immediately. And that means getting the main ship and all of its resources out of the way yep. so that the characters we are focusing on will have very limited resources to use at their disposal. Well, and even In, when they were supposedly meeting with this ambassador, you don't, we don't see him. I know. We don't even see that. So it's clearly just to get Voyager out of the way so that the Doctor and Balana can be in this small situation where they're threatened and can't just beam away. Mm-hmm. Also, they don't even have all the resources they should have. Belana has to in her final conflict. Now, I wanted to say I like what the hologram does to her. Because when it's fighting her, it reaches, I mean, it can turn insubstantial at will. Mm -hmm. And it can turn different parts of its body substantial or insubstantial. So it reaches into her chest and grabs her heart and starts squeezing. And... The doctor later tells us it punctured her fourth ventricle, which is interesting because humans only have two ventricles. We have be two, Klingon. two atria and two yep. ventricles, yeah. uh, but she's got four. And what she and then eventually she takes it out by ripping a cable out of the wall that's an electrical cable and waving it through the hologram. <laughs> Check out <this> conduit. <laughs> yeah, so she like uh, disrupts its electrical field which should only work temporarily, but does permanently for some reason. What she ought to do is whip out her phaser yeah. because you're going into another environment. You should have, you should have a sidearm and she ought to, a phaser ought to disrupt a hologram. You know, right. they're, they're both phased energy, light construct things. So she ought to be able to just phaser they, it. They did, they did say early on, cause there's a point where she's the point where the, uh, uh, they introduced by the way, you never did say his name. His name's Djarin. Djarin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's bringing the food to Balana and there's a cable there, you know, fancies, you know, future cable sitting there and he's ste- about to step close to it. And she said that if he had contacted with it, it would have disrupted his matrix. In other words, he it would stabilized have destroyed his him. program. Yeah. And, yeah. And basically it's, this is some kind of hollow ISO, whatever power conduit where it's not a typical power conduit, but it has something to do with the holographic system. That if he got in contact with it, so it was it was it's Chekhov's cable is basically what it was, mm-hmm. you know that this oh this is how it was going to end up killing him and it was so that that so it wasn't just a typical power con it wasn't you know two twenty yeah. volt power con or something like something like well, that. It also goes back to the the big problem the way that they envision the hologram technology throughout 
Voyager and throughout Star Trek, which is that the holoprograms are weirdly self-contained. So the doctor doesn't make a copy of himself and send it into the mobile emitter and still exist uh, on the ship, mm -hmm. which he should be able to do. No, no, he downloads his program and erases it from the, the, Enterprise, yeah. the Voyager's computer. And it's like, and if you destabilize the, the Dejarin right in front of you, you know, it's not, his program won't reload from the computer. It's gone. It, it's just like, it's just, this is, this has that's been a, the pro common, a problem. There's been yeah. a common complaint with how Star Trek handles data. I mean, just the idea of, you know, they have pads. Okay. But that's the only way you pass the data. You don't, it's right. not like, you know, what we can do today is, oh, let me, let me, you know, let, let me, me email you the file, drop that to you. Let me, you <laughs> yeah. know, put this on Dropbox and you can get a copy of it. Oh no, it's, it's, I have to give you this physical iPad so that right. you can then read whatever I need to give you. They don't have a cloud on board any Starfleet vessels. <laughs> At least Battlestar Galactica, you know, did it right where they just said all our computers are disconnected. Because we of have the, to literally make Cylons. a copy and take it to yeah. somewhere else. Because of Cylons. Um, so, and, and it is, and just to, to finish up with the Jaren and the doctor, like it's not till the Jaren assumes that the doctor is a prisoner on Voyager that the doctor realizes that the Jaren is cuckoo for Coco Bus and, and, mm -hmm. and realizes. So that's, that's the final straw for the doctor. Um, all right, let's, let's deal with the, um, Harry Kim in the room oh. um, and just we quickly, <laughs> Harry Kim is like Jordy LaForge. Mm -hmm. Like we just talked about the Jordy, Jordy being made into the bad with women character on mm. his, on only, his show. Only Jordy was popular enough. He could make a condition of his comeback show. I've been successful with women. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Exactly. Uh, I don't think if Harry Kim ever came back, he would give, give or get that, that opportunity. Um, so, uh, and, and I mean, even to having a hologram romance once, like Harry had been, you know, matched up with a hologram. Like it just, it was, it's weird repetition. I'm not sure why they did this. Um, they were, they were desperate to find scripts to use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just, it, it's part of the unfortunate sexualization of Jerry Ryan's character here, you know, where the, in this early stage, we need to bring in the sexy, uh, uh, Borg and, you know, have her in her cat suit and do all the stuff. And so they were early. I'm, I'm glad they, they kind of move away from this a little bit, not mm -hmm. far enough in my opinion, I guess, but, um, but Harry falls for her cause Harry falls for everybody. And, uh, and even Paris puts a, puts a pin in it. You know, you're always going for the tough ones, Harry. You're always, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then we have this whole awkward scene. I mean, it would have been fine up to this point, but that awkward scene in the mess hall where, Harry is hinting that they should go to a hollow program on a beach again, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the repetition. And she bluntly says, Oh, you want to do this and that and engage in reproductive behavior. And, and, you know, she's a boy. She doesn't understand subtlety. And she's like, sure, whatever. Let's go. And it's like, and, and then Harry backs down because it's, it's too forward for him or whatever. Uh, yeah. I actually, uh, now this scene was one that they apparently used with auditions for the seven of nine role mm -hmm. to see how the actresses would perform. And, you know, Jerry Ryan won the part and I assume deservedly so, cause she's good in the role. Right. But, uh, the, it's not the only scene that they used for auditions, but it was one of them. And Jerry Ryan didn't like this scene um, and said she might not have taken the part if they hadn't shown her other scenes as well. Um, so she kind of tolerated doing this scene. I think it's, it's really, I find it embarrassing for Harry. Mm -hmm. I find it less embarrassing for Seven as a character, given where she's coming from. She's been part of this collective. And she has not, the Borg apparently don't reproduce the way we do, although they kind of, it. they probably use sperm banks or something, who knows. Right. But, because uh, we have seen a Borg baby before, right. you know. The, although here she doesn't mention that, she just mentions assimilating other races, mm -hmm. but that's not really how you build a, a population. You need something beyond just assimilating, keep your popula population numbers up. But in any event, she's not been for her entire adult life has not thought in in male female reproductive terms, and but she's picking up on when he when Harry suggests that they go to this he'll show her this holodeck simulation. She says, "Oh, you are attempting to create a romantic environment." 
And that's exactly what he's trying to do, but Mm -hmm. it's not handled in the subtle way that humans would do that. And so he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, then you wish to copulate. (laughs) And it's, whoa, and that's way too forward for him. Um, And she, and uh, as he's flummoxed for a minute, she's like, well, I haven't been thinking in these terms, but now that I'm becoming human again, I'm open to exploring different aspects of my humanity. And actually, that makes sense Mm -hmm. for her as a character. And so I don't mind the way Seven is written in this. It's incredibly cringy for mm-hmm. Harry, yeah. but it but for Seven coming from the background that she has as a character, this actually this actually would make sense for her and she wouldn't have the cultural understanding of marriage and reproduction mm-hmm. and the weight of all of these things that mm-hmm. real humans have because we grew up in a human culture and she didn't. She just knows mm-hmm. this is part of humanity and I need to explore human humanity since I'm becoming a human again. So I should explore this. Yeah. Yeah. But not all, not in this way. <laughs> well, and that, that is the one thing I do like about this particular plot line is it is a plot line of her trying to figure out what it means to be human because it starts mm-hmm. with her getting injured when they pull a piece of you know navigational technology or whatever out of a Borg equipment and she gets injured she gets cut on the hand like very seriously cut on the hand it wasn't just a little little flesh wound it was it was deep and she's trying to you know oh well if I were Borg I would have already been healed the nanobots would have already healed me you know so that part of it was mm-hmm. was good but I just it the whole thing was was kind of cringy. I mean, it, it was comical where her reaction though was like, "Oh, you want to you want to copulate? Let's go." <laughs> right. You know, it is I interesting hurt you. <laughs> to, to contrast this with Dejarin because you know he finds revulsion at the the gross human biological organic things, whereas you know Seven is coming from a Borg perfection machine perfection environment too, mm-hmm. and. For her, she's not experiencing that revulsion. Where she might, like a couple episodes, she probably would have. But now, mm-hmm. as she's become more human, she's actually more interested in that human human connection. Uh, you know, the human aspects of re- these relationships. She doesn't understand it. She doesn't have the moral or cultural underpinnings, like you mentioned, Jimmy. You know, but but it's it, it's she's not revolted by it. And I think that's an interesting contrast inside this story. And so maybe. This story, this B plot is not, in retrospect, maybe not. it's not quite so bolted on as it might have seemed at first. Well, maybe, but it's also, I think it's mismatched because it's comedic in tone. Yeah. N- mm-hmm. Not in the way, now, you can use comedy in horror films. They help break the tension. But this is not that. No. Um, this is cringy. And you could have done it dramatic, like, you know, without all the comedy. You could have had, you know, light humor, but yeah. made it a more... Dramatic, romantic thing. So, yeah. yeah. Also, why are her nanobots not healing her now? That doesn't make sense to me. Mm. I mean, her they make a big deal out of her nanobots. Um, but Maybe if they, they would have... Deactivated that feature of the nanobots? I don't know. Why don't would say. you want to deactivate that, though? I, I think they're still... The writers are still figuring out exactly the parameters yeah. of, of her, what she's, how Borg she still is. And yeah. in fact, I think Jerry Ryan had said, she felt like they gave her too much of a sense of humor in this episode. It's yes. too early. And they backed mm-hmm. off on that. So she yeah. didn't, she, she kind of cracks a joke with Harry mm-hmm. and, and they back off on that. She doesn't crack any more jokes for a while. Right. So in the end, ha- there was an amusing scene where Harry's trying to get out of working with seven now because he feels awkward. Uh, he should feel awkward. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and Chakotay is, keep saying, no, no, I think you guys work great together. No, no. I, you know, is there any reason why you shouldn't be in? The, oh, no, no. We get along. I mean, and, and as, as he leaves uh, with Chakotay having basically said, you are going to do your job and you're going to do it. And oh, by the way, this is an order. Yeah. yeah. Um, Chakotay smirks. He knew exactly what he was doing <laughs> to, to Harry here. He knew what was going on. And and he was teasing ha- uh, Harry about him and Seven working together. I thought that was kind of a funny little subtle moment. Maybe Beltran throwing in the smirk as a sort of added mm-hmm. layer. But well, uh, that, I thought it was. Kind I of mean, funny. he even he told Harry, "He's like, well, oh, I, you, I talked with Seven about this, and she says that you're you know, a reasonably efficient worker and all these things." <laughs> and he's like, "Wait, you talk to her?" Yeah, <laughs> it, it, he totally undercuts Harry in this. This is very cringy for Harry, which is where the humor is supposed to derive from. And that Harry is trying to 
bluff his way without revealing that he put the moves on Seven. Um, he's trying to get out of having to work with her. And he says, you know, we had a misunderstanding. And 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 he's trying to make, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. But we had a misunderstanding. It would be better if she took the lead on this and I bowed out of this project. Mm-hmm. And because we had this minor misunderstanding. And Chakotay just cuts him off at the knees and says, well, that's not what she said. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like suddenly Harry realizes he's been talking to Seven. And it's like she said you were reasonably efficient and helped her explore aspects of her, huma- her humanity, and mm. so that sounds good to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, if Harry wasn't so immature, he should have just said to Seven in the mess hall, "No, no, no! I just want to get to know you better. I'm interested in you. You're an interesting person. You've had experiences mm-hmm. that no other human being has had." I'd like to become your friend and to and to mm-hmm. to know you better. Even right. if he did ad, ad, have romantic intentions, but but Harry is just so immature here. I mean, he's a kid. You know, he's about twenty two out of the academy or something. So it's hard to blame him. But um, yeah, a, a more mature officer might. He should, <laughs> he should be a better liar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in <laughs> fact, ch- ch- yeah, right. The 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 social lie of of dating. Chicote, in fact, actually shows how to do this much better later on. You know, the, at the end of the series, uh, as with seven. They, with seven um and it's interesting to see how seven has evolved into the picard era and what a different person she is from this early on Mm -hmm. version of seven and how she's changed a lot so uh, it's interesting to see that uh any other notes on this episode father Corey? so the end is the doctor back in in a sick bay and he's you know upset with with tom paris because he's made a mess out of sick bay you know tom paris (laughs) is now the nurse and he's made a mess out of sick bay and he does he does the the little joke of oh you know you you organics cause so much trouble you know he's trying like acting like he's going he's, he's psycho. freaking freaking Bolana out yeah freaking <laughs> yeah. Bolana out big time and he goes ah just kidding it should be more organic <laughs> and drops it and of course there's a line about I should be quite so fastidious and, and, and it's like uh, you're in sick bay that's the one place on the ship where you want someone to be fastidious, especially with <laughs> cleansing the, you know, things like viruses and bacteria. Right. Hyperspace should not be on the floor. <laughs> you know, but it was, it was, it was, it was kind of a clever or not a clever ending, but it was, it was, it was kind of a funny ending, you know, kind of end yeah. on a high note, kind of the, kind of the Voyager version of the, the TOS, you know, the clarinet the of humor minor between clarinet of humor. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's right. You, if this were TOS, that would have had the clarinet of humor as he put his feet mm-hmm. up on the desk. That's true. Uh, all right, uh, Jimmy, how about you? Anything left? Uh, just, I, I thought it was interesting. At one point we get into this situation where after the hologram, squeezes Bellana's heart and makes her unconscious. It then goes to confront the doctor and they're basically having a slap fight because both of them can turn insubstantial. Right. Yeah. And the doctor at one point looks at, at Dejar and is like, so what are you going to do now? We're both, we, we can both turn yeah. insubstantial to each other. <laughs> and Dejarin, who has like it, I forget what, but it's something like a pickaxe. He just swings it at the doctor's mobile emitter and causes him to vanish. It's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, there wasn't there was an asymmetry breaker here. Yeah, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so that is our discussion of revulsion. Uh, we, like I said, we had some feedback, and this comes from our uh, discussion of the previous uh, Voyager episode we had on initiations from the second season. Uh, the first one, the first comment comes from Brian, who uh, is a patron. Uh, thank you, Brian, for your support. Uh, and he says, I enjoy the secrets of Star Trek. For the episode Initiations, I heard a podcast where it was discussed that Aaron Eisenberg was cast because he was 26 and they wouldn't have the same union regulations they would have if they'd cast a minor actor. So That could easily be also Aaron Eisenberg um, as Nog was wor- worth were used to working with latex makeup Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they wouldn't they there there are various actors who can't really work with latex including for allergic reasons and so it's like okay he's the right height he can pass for the right age he's an adult and he can work with latex Mm -hmm. let's use him and just not notice the fact that his voice will make him immediately identifiable (laughs) i mean Uh, we've worked with him before we know he's a a known quantity yeah we've got his social security number it was, yeah, the, the, the latex didn't hide him that bad, that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is very distinctive looking, uh, like uh, Max Rodenchek. Um, mm-hmm. 
And then we got uh, a YouTube comment from Mark Gillies who writes, I, I wasn't paying close attention, but I think I got your summary. Nog is a Ferengi and Chakotay is a genius. Yeah, yep. that pretty much sums it up. Sure. Sounds good. <laughs> we'll go with that. We'll go with that. <laughs> All right. Thank you both for your feedback. We really appreciate it. And now we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Erica P., Jonah M., Jonathan L., Father Paul H., and John W. Their generous tax-deductible donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edited this episode. So what did you think of a revulsion? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek, our Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. Send an email to trek at sqpn.com or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash Discord. You can comment and watch The Secrets of Star Trek uh, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash StarQuest Media. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Enterprise episode, Desert Crossing. Not Desert Crossing, that would have been so much better, but Desert Crossing. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing The Secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper, you disgusting, <laughs> skin-dropping, oily, organic life form. <laughs> And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, the last time we worked together, I struck you at the base of your skull and attempted to contact the Collective. But these things happen. <laughs> <laughs>